Welcome back to ResTube for another interview, fellow fans. I'm Danny Riggs, and our interview today is with video artist John Sanborn. John has been active as an artist since the 1970s. His work has been shown all over the world, from the Whitney Museum in the MoMA in New York, to the Prado in Madrid, and the Tate Gallery in London, and many more. He's made music videos and feature-length projects. He's worked for Columbia TriStar, MTV, and Comedy Central, among others. His first collaboration with the residents was 1991's The Eyes Scream VHS, and their most recent work together was the performance of God in Three Persons at the MoMA in 2020. In the decades between the two projects, he has been involved in many different res works. Not only did he make time to record answers to my questions, but he also added a beautiful array of pictures and video clips to go along with them. So I have decided not to interrupt his segment, but instead to let him tell his story about his friendship and work with the group the way he recorded it. So, without any further ado, here's ResTube's interview with John Sanborn. Hello, Danny. Hello, Residence fans. My name is John Sanborn, and I'm happy to speak to you today about the residents. I've known the residents for decades and decades, since the late 1970s. And I'm going to do this a little old school, a little raw, because the residents have always used whatever they have at hand to be able to create their songs, their stories, their mythologies, and that's something that I actually admire a great deal. Danny's given me a bunch of questions, and I'm going to try and answer them as best I can. I'll throw in some illustrations when possible. I was living in New York. I was uh, a young kid, and uh, I was going to go to California for the first time. I was going to go do some shows in San Francisco, and a good friend of mine, Chip Lord, from the group Ant Farm, who I'd met in 1977 in Paris at the Paris Biennial, said, oh yeah, let's get together and there's this group of guys that you need to meet doing some really weird stuff called The Residents. And um, I'd never heard of The Residents. I asked some people, they said, oh yeah, a really weird music group. Um, I hadn't heard anything. And uh, we arranged for a meeting at the residence studio, which at the time was very impressive to me. It was a fully equipped sound studio, and uh, they had VCRs of all kinds. This is three quarter inch and uh, half inch open reel, not yet VHS. But they were also playing around with laser discs, and that's one of the things that Chip had said. He said, they're f***ing with laser discs, and what they're doing is really interesting. So I was working at the time with a woman named Kit Fitzgerald, and we showed up at the residence studio. We met them. Didn't exactly know what to think about them. They seemed like regular people, and they started playing us uh, various songs, uh, gave us vinyl, Santa Dog, and... Uh, uh, meet the residents, and I thought, God, these guys are really crazy. And they were doing something that I could relate to, which was they were taking a established American art form, uh, the sound book, the song book of American music, and they were just bashing on it with whatever they had at hand. And I remember that in the studio, while there was a tremendous sense of confusion, there were boxes and instruments and uh, records all over the place, there was a single-mindedness about what they were doing and how they were doing it. Uh, and Kit and I brought some videos, and we, shot, we showed some videos, and we talked a lot about uh, one-minute movies, uh, which they had done recently, and we looked at that. So it was, a, it was an interesting meeting, in my, of meeting, meeting of minds. And um, for many years after that, we stayed in touch. But at first it was, they were doing their thing and I was doing my thing. Uh, second question, what are their first projects you remember liking? Well, I liked everything that they did. Um, You've got to remember that in the 1970s, there was no 
real understanding of media art. There was beginnings of video art, there were sound artists, um, but the residents were a band, but they were a band in a hugely different way than anybody else was a band. They were anonymous, which I thought was a kind of a captivating concept. Um, and, and again, their assault on uh, songs and songwriting at the time was unbelievably unique. There was really nobody else who was doing anything like it. What I didn't understand is probably more important is I, I didn't understand two things that since that time have become very clear to me. The first is that they knowingly or unknowingly, and since I, I understand them having worked with them for many, many years, it was probably unknowingly, they took a very naive perspective towards the way that you build mythologies. Their initial conceit of anonymity, which ended up being something that just absolutely fascinates and frustrates both fans and newcomers alike, was something I had never really come across. Why would you be anonymous? If, in fact, you feel like you have a statement to make, you have things to say, and you want people to understand where it's coming from and, and why you're saying it. But that, that anonymity they have used to tremendous effect. But at the time, I thought it was just a gag. I thought it was a joke. I thought it was some way to sort of differentiate them, which possibly it was. But it ends up being a blank canvas that we as fans or we as appreciators can project ourselves onto. The residents are spirits, not really a band. They are people, but you don't interact with them as the residents regarding them as people. You can have friendships with them. I'm, I'm friends with the residents. But that blank canvas aspect is very, very, very powerful. The second thing I didn't understand <laughs> was that they were harnessing a community. They had adopted, or they had actually kind of manufactured, an idea of social networks before any of us had any idea that this was possible. If you were a fan, you were one of many. You were a droplet in a wave, or you were uh, a molecule in an ocean but you had no way to understand how your actions and reactions would interact with those thousands and thousands of other fans. But they, they knew that in order for them to be successful, for them to be able to have the freedom and the license and the agency to be able to do what they wanted to do, that they would leverage the power of the fans. They would take that social situation and they would parlay it into record sales through their own record company, their own business venture, and through the merchandise and the succession of releases that would take their mythology and slowly but inexorably twist it. So the canon of the residents was not obvious to me when I first met them. Next question is about the first project that we did together. And I'm here in my studio, uh, which has a lot of residence uh, material because I've worked with them over the years. And they gift me with uh, detritus and uh, artifacts. And I'm very pleased about that. The first project that we did together was a, uh, a history of the residents. They had been asked by British television to to put together a show, an hour-long show. And I was familiar with the residents, but I wasn't necessarily dug very deeply into who they were, where they came from. Um, but I, I, quickly, <laughs> I quickly learned a great deal about who they are and how they started. Um, and part of that had to do with the fact that Penn and Teller, the famous American magicians, who I was enormous fans of, uh, were also fans of the residents, particularly Penn Gillette. And from discussions, we decided that they would host this history of the residents. We were able to record interviews with uh, 
Hardy Fox and Homer Flynn, representatives of the Cryptic Corporation. And I thought it was interesting that while the band was anonymous, there were spokespeople for the band who could talk to uh, how the residents worked. Um, but Hardy and Homer described themselves kind of as babysitters for the band, making sure that they didn't get into too much trouble. And there was a kind of an oblique relationship uh, between the Cryptic Corporation and the residents that I found fascinating. Um, I had access to uh, all their material, um, and over the course of uh, a few months, we put together what I think is a really solid uh, documentary. This is in the 1980s, and the residents are relatively easy to work with. Um, and part of that is that they understand uh, with uh, Graham Whiffler or Snakefinger or Laurie Amat or Joshua Brody, when they're working with other artists, the other artists basically become a resident. Um, they're not officially given an eyeball head, but uh, the combining of forces, the ability to put the residents' ideas and the skills, talents, and abilities of their collaborators together enhances everybody's way of working, makes the projects more interesting. And I found that to be true with The Eyes Scream because uh, Penn and Teller were more than happy to celebrate the residents. Uh, they felt, as I did then and I do now, that the more people who understand this approach to art making, to music making, to the uh, alteration and obliteration of culture, the better. We, we take what we're given <laughs> and we can be spoon fed the worst crap possible and be told that it's mm, absolutely delicious. But unless we actually go in and we start with the mechanics of how creative works uh, come to be, how they are distributed, and their impact on society, and uh, the nature of the appreciation of art. We're really just sheep. We're really just following a, a herd. Uh, and that's not as interesting as being able to say, oh, yes, no, I, I'm really going to go in uh, firsthand, and I'm going to mess with things. Um, and that's something that I did learn when we did the eyes scream. Um. I moved to California in uh, the early 1990s. I'd stayed friends with the residents. I could never really understand their f fascination with me because the things that we talk about in our works, at least at the time in the 1980s and the early 1990s, were very, very different. It's not a set of connections, but it is a parallel set of concerns and obsessions that, that bring us together. And as time has passed, <laughs> my obsessions and their obsessions have overlapped more and more and more. So I came out to California. I was uh, working a lot in Japan with Sony and Pioneer and um, other high-tech agencies I'd worked with in New York, some of the first uh, HD gear that Sony had created, 720p, which at the time just seemed like a miraculous <laughs> advancement. Of course, my phone right now is a thousand times more powerful and, and obviously I can hold it in my hands. It's much more interesting than what we were doing in the late 80s, but uh, I worked a lot with Japan. I worked a lot in Hollywood, more and more with Hollywood. Um, and the residents were starting to get involved with interactive media, and I was doing the same. They were working with a brilliant but uh, tragically lost 3D artist named Jim Ludke, I met Ludke, I loved Ludke. We all revolved around a uh, application called Macromedia's uh, Director. 
uh, which was created by Macromind and then Macromedia, uh, which was started by a guy named Mark Cantor, who I fell into business with. Um, and low-cost computer graphics were also a thing. And they, with Jim Ludke, were creating computer graphics characters. I was working with Todd Rundgren using the new tech video toaster. Uh, and again, fascinated by what the residents were doing, the way that they were adopting this technology very quickly. And as they were doing with recording technology and American songs, they were smashing it and battering it and, and turning it into their own storytelling engine. Um, and they asked me to play a character, a voice character on Bad Day at the Midway. I was very pleased to do that. That was being published by a group in Los Angeles, and I also was working with them at the same time. So there were a lot of places where we converged. Um, let's see. The thing about Bad Day on the Midway was, at the time, uh, interactive media, CD-ROMs, DVD-ROMs were... Uh, seen as the next big thing, the way virtual reality has been seen as the next big thing, or the internet is the next big thing. Don't know if it really turned out that way, but what I found curious was their approach to how this could affect their storytelling. Um, the resident storytelling is not obvious. While they have a tremendous streak of naivete, um, and they are as much prose as they are poetry. Um, that naivete is usually presented in a very complex package. Um, it feels simple, but trust me, uh, after working on God in Three Persons and digging deep into the psychology of the character and the songs, these are not simple events. These are not unstaged or unconsidered narratives. They tie themselves to deep roots, um, again, very American roots, um, but they are flushed out in, in ways that are uh, absolutely captivating. And I remember at the time thinking, and I was making an interactive movie, that I was taking one set of values and I was using interactivity to pervert those values. Whereas the residents were absolutely uh, kind of a generation ahead. They were writing stories for interactivity and I was taking interactivity and I was applying it to stories. Um, but still there were, there were many things we had in common and I remained very good friends with them, which was, uh, which was quite a delightful thing. My studio right now is a complete mess. Uh, there are my dogs, there's my work table, uh, that's my editing rig over there. It's a mess because I have a big show up in San Francisco. I also am working on some projects in Europe. And so there's lots of empty boxes because all the screens are being used. My wife is Sarah Cahill, who is a pianist. She plays contemporary classical music, a lot by living composers. And a few years ago, she had this idea for a project that this is during the, uh, the wars in the Middle East, which are sadly still happening in some cases. Uh, she wanted to do a project about peace, and she remembered what uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, was preaching about in terms of uh, that peace was a sweeter music than the, uh, the sound of war. And so she was commissioning different composers to write on the subject of peace, and I created a series of uh, environments for her to play surrounded by three channels of video um, where I was creating individual pieces for each of these tunes. And uh, she went to a lot of the composers that she knew, Yoko Ono, Meredith Monk, Frederick Zhevsky, uh, Jerome Kitsky, uh, and I suggested that she commission the residents because I thought, number one, they could 
write something really interesting. And the second is that many of the works that she was commissioning involved her to vocalize, either to speak or to sing or to make different sounds as she was playing the piano. And I thought what the residents will be able to do is they'll be able to bring character into this kind of situation. Um, and what I was hoping is that the residents would appear in some form uh, in the video and that the spoken track and the music track would come together with the images and the live performance in such a way that the character of the residents, because the residents are very much about character, uh, would emerge. And, and that's what happened. Uh, they wrote a piece called uh, Fife No Drum. And it's an interesting take on our approach, almost our fear of peace, as opposed to our desire to embrace it. Um, and the work, I think, is very successful. And I had fun because it, I was taking part of my world and bringing it into the world that my wife occupies so successfully. And A Sweeter Music premiered in 2009 at uh, Cal Performances in Berkeley, and we toured it around the world when Sarah uh, decided to put out a CD of the finished, finished works done in a recording studio. I formatted the three channel videos uh, to, um, to represent kind of a final version of each of the pieces. Everybody, 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 everybody. I drifted away from the art world. I was still making art, but I wasn't necessarily devoted to it. From around the late 1990s till about five or six years ago. I went to Hollywood for a while. I was in New York in 2000 and 2001, working uh, to create a digital division for Comedy Central. And uh, I came back after September 11th, because everything there got shut down that I was doing. And I spent some time doing some startups and doing a lot of work with Silicon Valley. But about five or six years ago, I decided I was going to go back to making media art full time. I had the means, I had the motive, I had the opportunity. And in um, 2016, I was gonna be doing a big show in France with a mutual friend of ours named Isabelle Carlier at an organization called Bandimage. And the residents called and said, uh, we're putting out a new record. Would you be interested in making a music video? And I said, well, sure, what's the tune? What's the concept? And I listened to the song. It was very short, two minutes. And I immediately thought, okay, I know what to do. Because I had returned to making media, I was surrounding myself with artwork and different kinds of inputs. Uh, and if you remember 2016, Trump was running for president. Uh, and what he brought, the chaos, the hate, the fear, the bull that he brought to American politics was at a level that was uh, almost impossible to bear. And I thought that the noise uh, of culture, the noise of politics um, was tearing at my very soul. And I heard in Rushing Like a Banshee 
a similar sound, um, a desire to, uh, in an anarchistic kind of way, because the residents are at heart anarchists, uh, to tear things down, an anarchistic desire to tear things down. And I had quickly this image in my head of uh, the mechanics of joy, the mechanics of fear, the mechanics of hate, and the voice of the residents trying to break through this, tear through this, bring it down. And at the end of the day, I think the conclusion is that the triumph is the noise wins. The, the, the residents are attempting something, but at the end of the day, um, they are a strong voice, but a lone voice. Um, and time, time has caught up with them, but <laughs> oddly enough, uh, they are still ahead of their time. So I brought uh, the lead singer of the residents into my studio and uh, very quickly using some uh, facial appliances uh, created a way to insert the singer into the noise field, the sort of the chaotic uh, barrage that we're, we were all living through to insert the singer into that environment. And then I was editing it in France as I was preparing to do an enormous show in uh, Clermont-Ferrand and I was editing in the living room of a friend where I was staying and I will absolutely remember her coming back to um, find me editing <laughs> and saying what are you doing I said oh I'm working with the residents oh show me show me show me and I showed her and she was like Ugh. and I finished the work and I sent it to the residents and the residents said well it's not exactly what we had in mind, but we like it very, very much. And there, in a, in a nutshell, is one of the reasons why I keep collaborating with the residents, because their expectations and my expectations, while not always coinciding, definitely add up to more than the sum of the individual parts. In 2020, it was a miserable time. <laughs> it's a year we lost. But in fact, I had the pleasure of doing a lot of projects, spontaneous projects, that I wouldn't necessarily have done if we hadn't been all locked down. Starting in April, I was getting calls from friends, mostly musicians, some dancers, saying, I can't tour, um, I need to get myself out there. Uh, do you want to do something together? And I did a couple of projects with a band called Commando uh, with two fantastic artists, Juba and Lynn. Uh, and I would not have made those works if we hadn't been in the middle of a pandemic. I also got a call from the residents. This is my, uh, the room I've been talking to you in where I edit, but I have another space here. I got a call from the residents about sort of midway through the year that they were working on a new project and was I interested in creating uh, a music video for one of the songs. And the, the concept was absolutely fantastic. It, it involved, again, the American songbook, uh, the blues, and uh, another element of mythology that I found fascinating, that a discovery of an unknown singer-songwriter and uh, out of that discovery, uh, a series of reinterpretations of, uh, of the songs of this songwriter. And uh, I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, what do you have in mind? And uh, they sent me the song, Bury My Bone. And I really liked it. Again, short, punchy. And there's two things that the residents do that I find fascinating. The first is that they uh, they change the nature of who is telling the story almost with every single recording. Uh, there's a number of personas that they've created. Randy uh, Rose is you know, the, one of the best known. Um, 
But when they change these personas, they alter them in very subtle ways. Um, for Bury My Bone, uh, this distortion of that narrator, that lead character, was something that I, I thought we could have a lot of fun with. Uh, I also like the fact that part of the aesthetic of the residents is that they, uh, connected to their naivete, they enjoy doing things quickly, simply, very boldly. And so Bury My Bone was shot here, shot in the woods. I brought in a couple of dancers. I wanted to make something that had uh, the subtext, this kind of very sexy, suggestive subtext, put into a, a very awkward foreground position. Because that's the other thing the residents do, is they change the landscape for the narrators. Where the story is being told, who's telling it, and the nature of the storytelling shifts with almost everything they do. I brought you in here. This is my second room of my studio. Um, and this is, I can turn this into a production stage. Here you've got some green screen. Uh, it's also a mess <laughs> because I'm in the middle of a bunch of different things. But it's also here where I shot the material for God in Three Persons. And God in Three Persons started uh, with, again, a phone call from the residents saying that they were going to take their classic LP, God in Three Persons, done in 1988, and they were going to adapt it for the stage. And they were having a reading, uh, a stage reading of the work uh, with some new orchestrations of the different song elements. And would I come and you know, take a look, take a listen, and give some feedback? And I went. This was with ACT in San Francisco, which is a very uh, august organization. And uh, uh, the take that they had on the project, the ACT take, was to emphasize aspects of the story that typically have not been in the foreground. The fact that the twins are conjoined. If you don't know the story, it's uh, a disgraced preacher falls in lust with a pair of uh, miracle workers or potential miracle workers who are in fact conjoined twins. And uh, it doesn't end well. And it's a lot about repression, about self-knowledge, uh, and the dark side of, of the human soul. Uh, it's also got a lot of gender politics mixed into it. And I, I thought the take was interesting. But the narrator of the song, again, an instance of the resonance manipulating you as the listener, as the viewer, by distorting your relationship to the person who's telling the story. The narrator is called Mr. X, and uh, it's not really clear, or it wasn't really clear to me that he's telling us the truth, so he's an unreliable narrator. And he tells us in pretty strong narrative terms exactly what's happening, or what did happen, because it's kind of a a big flashback. And I thought, well, that's interesting, but if you've got such a demonstrative narrative told by uh, a character that we have some sympathy for, but who is actually pretty disreputable, what are you going to put on stage? Uh, you don't really want to see the material nature of the twins. You don't want them to necessarily be uh, two performers hooked together <laughs> by some device. Uh, and what else is there in the story that would be interesting to portray in visual terms, in media terms? And so I said, uh, there are things going on in the story that I think could be uh, told, but told in a complement or conflict with uh, what Mr. X is saying. And I think we could do that with video. And I think actually I could create a, a video environment, um, a stage setting um, that would have the twins, that would have 
a number of uh, interesting aspects of the psychology of Mr. X, sort of what's going on in his mind and his soul, as he's telling us the lurid details of his relationship with the twins. So the residents thought that was interesting. So what, what's that going to look like? So I wrote a script. I took the songs and I said, all right, I'm going to translate it for the stage. I'm going to adapt it. And I'm going to adapt it for the stage and for uh, three channels of video as elements that are going to extend the story and really bring you inside the, the darkness that's, that is Mr. X. So we did a very quick down and dirty mock-up again in the studio that you saw. Um, the residents pitched it to the Museum of Modern Art in New York and uh, they loved it. And they, it turns out the residents are in their permanent collection. I'm in their permanent collection. So they said, well, this is kind of a no-brainer. Uh, we've got you know, two, two artists working together, both of whom we, uh, we obviously have invested in. Um, and we raised money. We did a very successful Indiegogo campaign, again, leveraging the social aspect of the residents, but giving the, the investors a lot of good rewards for having gotten uh, themselves uh, financially involved in it. Uh, the show opened in January of 2020 at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, and I was very happy to uh, be a full-fledged collaborator on this when I do things like uh, Bury My Bone or Rushing Like a Banshee. I'm, uh, again, I'm part of the spiritual nature of the residence. I'm not necessarily a uh, name above the title, but for this, because I had done the adaptation and, and really the impact of the work was a fusion of my talents and the residents' talents, uh, I was very happy with positioning it that way um, because the residents cast a huge shadow and it's very comfortable to be in the shadow of the residents. But for something on this level, I felt like uh, I wanted to, to make people understand exactly how the operation was successful and the patient lived. Uh, God in Three Persons originally had three songs that we didn't include in the first version including loss of a loved one where you hear about the passing of Mrs. X. And one of the things that I felt was very successful about my adaptation and the way it was staged, uh, is directed for the stage by Travis Chamberlain, was I wanted a double of Mr. X on stage to represent the duality, uh, the good versus evil, the dark versus light uh, that's going on, the, the war that's going on inside of Mr. Mr. X. So a dance double was created um, and with loss of a loved one you have another echo or shadow character which is Mrs. X and so I could take a lot of the material and the ideas that we had started with and I could extend them even further. Um, the, deepest point of connection for me with God and Three Persons is not just the journey into darkness, but it's the deliberation about what do we do with the dark parts of our soul. Do you confront it? Do you hide it? Mr. X wants to get to a higher plane. He wants to escape the darkness. He feels like he could exist on the same level that the twins exist because he feels like the twins have escaped the weight of darkness and are living, again, on a higher plane and in a better place. And he'd like to be there as well. But his, his impulses are bad. His decision making is awful. And uh, while he tells us at the end of the story that it's all good, we know that that's not the truth. And that lesson is a lesson we all have to learn. And so we're, we're talking about getting it back out on the road. We're also talking about a tour of Europe in uh, the fall of 2022. I was very gratified by the reaction of the audience, both fans and non-fans. It's a dark piece, but it was important 
to me as an artist to face that darkness. And it's just amazing that the residents do this all the time. They are unafraid to go as deep as possible into um, things that are just absolutely terrifying. One thing I can talk about briefly, besides taking God and Three Persons back out on tour, is that 2022 is in fact the uh, 50th anniversary of the residence. So there's been some discussion about how to celebrate that, how to acknowledge that. And uh, what has been gratifying for me you know, since the 1980s and our works together, but also our friendship going back to our first meeting, is they're giving me permission to go in and really f with the canon of uh, the residents. The mythologies that they've created, this idea of uh, the narrator and the landscapes, these are very powerful things that literally millions of people around the world are invested in. And so when I, I did uh, another project with them in um, 2020, they had done a great video called Die, Die, Die. And uh, in asking residence fans to do dance videos based on Die, 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 I assembled Dance, Dance, Dance. What that taught me, you know, I knew it, but I didn't really have first-hand knowledge of it, was just how dedicated, how focused, and how invested residence fans are. So they're invested in this mythology, they're invested in the way the, the residents transform song, uh, stylings, narration, uh, environments. Uh, and the residents giving me permission to go in and mess around with this stuff is, is absolutely amazing. It's very gratifying. Uh, I feel like I'm true to their intentions. I'm bringing my own bag of tricks and my own interpretations and I'm hopefully taking what they've established and I'm, I'm bringing it to a, another interesting place. I wouldn't say more interesting but interesting in other ways because I am both a fan um, and a collaborator. I'm both a fan and a partner in some ways but I'm also a fan and a friend and that friendship uh, surprises me sometimes because Often I will finish something or I'll be in the process of developing something and uh, I get tremendous support from the residents about where I want something to go. They have caveats, don't do this or we could see more of that or that's interesting or that's not that interesting. But the relationship is, is very fluid and very positive. We are about to create a, a an uh, in-studio concert version of uh, the music from Duck Stab, which they're going to be taking out on tour in uh, 2021. It's another instance of their going back to remix and reevaluate material from their canon. And part of that is the acknowledgement that while time has evolved, the residents in some ways have not. The roots that they put down in certain thematic statements have not shifted. They've grown and they've deepened, but they haven't necessarily changed with the times. There's a lot of bands, there's a lot of performers, there's a lot of icon iconographic performers who feel the need to bend to the will of pop culture. But pop, pop culture eats itself, and the residents know that because if you eat yourself, you're going to yourself and that's not what the residents do the residents are inventive when they do revisit their catalog they do it in ways to bring new insights new joy new fans uh and and new levels of understanding god in three persons is a perfect example um it's it's possibly one of their most popular lps but i don't think the understanding was uh as rich at the time, because they were talking about gender politics, they were talking about uh, gay fear, they were talking about uh, this idea of uh, what makes somebody a disabled person and how disabilities are not necessarily a minus, but can actually be uh, a very strong and aggressively positive force. 
those things weren't necessarily there in 1988, but now people are willing to accept and embrace those things, and, and we were able to bring those, draw those things out for the shows at the Museum of Modern Art and for the, the production of God in Three Persons. So Duck Stab is another, I, another way of taking something from the past and, and finding ways to change and reconnect its relevant points with both existing, uh, the existing audience and a new audience. So that's something that we're working on right now. We're actually going to be in production in about a month, and that's going to be available. And uh, I can't say exactly where, because I think it's not necessarily been announced, but that's exciting. The anecdotes, I, I would say the most interesting thing for me is that as I've learned more about the residents, I've been more involved with them. I've been honored to be uh, to be asked, you know, inside. And, and part of that is to maintain some of the values and attributes that made them interesting in the first place. Again, time has changed, but the residents in many ways have, they've kept their roots pure, they've kept their growth dynamic, and they've done that with a great deal of respect from everyone they work with uh, about their anonymity. And that anonymity is, again, a powerful tool that they've used for good and not for evil. So the last question, of course, is do, do I know who the residents are and can I tell you? Yes, I think I know who the residents are. And I, I mean not just the names of the people, but who the residents are. And the residents are spirits. The residents live in all of us. Uh, a few years ago, they did a project that I did, provided a little help for called I Am a Resident. And the reality of that is we are all residents. We're all in a position where we want to do what the residents do. We want to be able to mold and shape and interpret the world. And then we want to be able to be comfortable with that interpretation. We don't want that to be false or misleading. And I can tell you that knowing the residents means that I know that they're going to do this forever. And they're going to do it in such a way that all of us who are fans, all of us who are invested, are going to benefit from their being the residents. Well, I hope this was fun. I'm going to drop in some pictures and uh, look for new projects. It's kind of odd to say this, but after almost 50 years, they're working harder, they're working faster, and they're continuing to create, invent, and delight us all. See you soon.